Welcome to Iron Sights. This podcast candidly seeks to create opportunities and deliver impact by sharing the experiences and wisdom of successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders who unapologetically aim to win in health, fitness, business, and life. I'm your host, Scott Howell. Welcome to Old School Meets New School. Tradition meets innovation and imperfection meets excellence. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Well, hey, everybody. I want to welcome uh, Dr. David Skolnick, doctor of physical therapy, to uh, the Iron Sights podcast today. Welcome to the show, man. Thank you for having me. I'm super stoked to get uh, to get rolling and, and dig in a little bit. We've got some mutual connections, and I'm out here sort of on your home turf, actually, here in, uh, in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area, and had this opportunity to sit down and dig into a couple topics that I know you're really passionate about and have spent some time on, but... Uh, Man, thanks so much for coming down. It was on kind of short notice, and you pulled it together, and thanks. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, As a host of a podcast, it's always fun to have an opportunity to be a guest, uh, be on the other side of the mic. And you happen to come on the hottest day of the year, so <laughs> congratulations. Yeah, no, I, uh, I appreciate that. Like, I, I was watching the weather oh last God, week before insane. I came in, and I was like, this is like, this is, this is kind of hot on I'll damage you. Yeah. Like if you're not used to it. 117 and smoky. Well, it's interesting because there's that too. But for me, I've been in hot environments. I've lived in hot, hot environments. I've lived in the Central Valley in California for a while. But 116 was not not something we, we faced. And we certainly didn't face it for days on end. Uh, yet this weather, in, particularly as it relates to just training and, and health and fitness and being motivated, I walk out the door, man, and it's just, it's debilitating. It is so oppressive. <laughs> I mean, I don't even, I don't even want to work out while I'm here. I'm like, nah, man, I just want to sit in the air conditioning and drink ice water. Oh uh, yeah. I, so I was telling you before the show, I've only lived here since September. My wife is from here, so she's familiar with the heat and how to handle it. You know, I just got a big old screen, like a shade for the front of my car. So that's <laughs> fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> I don't put my sunglasses on and burn myself, yeah. but I went to the gym the other day and I'd left my gym bag in my trunk for like eight hours on a 112 degree yeah. day. So that was, I learned quickly, like putting on a hot t-shirt, yeah. putting hot earbuds yeah. in. It's disturbing. Yeah, the the, the pre workout like melts in the. Gross. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so you mentioned that you're you, you're the host of your own podcast, the uh, Essential Strength Podcast, and you're also the founder and and sort of you know a brain behind the um, the Stronger in Motion company. And so I want to talk about a, a little bit of that stuff and and let's start with the podcast and the Essential Strength Podcast. Tell us about it. What it what is it? Why are you doing it? And and uh. What are some of the things you guys are covering there? So the Essential Strength Podcast, we're coming up on or may have just crossed like a one year anniversary of starting the show. It was originally a joint effort between myself and a buddy of mine. His name is Mike McCastle. Uh, I think Chris mentioned to you I, that he I know a about great Mike. guest. Yeah, Mike, world record holder for most pull-ups in 24 hours and pulled a pickup truck across Death Valley for 20 miles and all this crazy stuff. And he and I were co-workers at Evolution Healthcare and Fitness in Portland. And we had started hosting some live workshops and then I got an opportunity in Northern California as a PT. So I left and about a year and a half later, we finally, we'd been kind of kicking back ideas about how do we start working together again? And we launched a podcast cause we yeah. could do that. He could be in Portland, I could be in California. Um, and so it was, the idea behind the Essential Strength Podcast was to explore strength in its many forms. You know, he and I, and now now it's just me. Um, Mike has just, he's been on assignment basically for the military in remote parts of Alaska for the better part of a year, and it just became impossible tough, to yeah. coordinate. Mm -hmm. um, but we both felt like strength was sort of an essential element to success and also that strength is way more multidimensional than most people give it credit for. So we want to talk about not just physical strength, but mental strength. We want to talk about um, intellectual strength and spiritual strength. And so with every guest, whether it's someone in the health and fitness industry, 
Um, like I've had my brother on the show who's a performing musician. We've had PhD researchers in, you know, behavioral sciences and, and professors and everything else, authors. But the first question for every guest is what is your personal definition of strength? Mm. And so that's been really cool now, 44 recorded episodes in, like how diverse those, um, definitions are. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of talking about resilience and humanity and being able to kind of hold your ground against resistance, whether that's physical, Mm -hmm. mental, emotional, uh, Mm -hmm. yeah, emotional, communal, like just societal pressure and being able to hold your ground and not waver. So it's been really cool. Yeah. So have you noticed it's been, you know, been a while now since you've been doing that as of late, are the answers changing Are are people, the answers that you're getting, the definitions that you're getting, are people recognizing that their definition now might have been different than it was, say, a year, 18 months ago, given yes. you know, all the things we've we've experienced as a society and as a globe. I've had I've had a number of people say, like, you know, if you'd asked me this six months ago, mm. I would have said something different. Um, yeah, I think everyone's definition of most things has changed probably in the last 15 months. But yeah, yeah I, I also I mean, the reason I started it and the reason I've kept it going is it's just really fun. Like I I've gone through a mentorship program for podcasting with Chase Tuning who hosts Everford right. Radio mm-hmm. and and it's, it's like you just get I get to have conversations with people that I would otherwise be paying to learn from. Right. Same. Really yeah. cool. Same same. It's a bit uh it's I've I've used the term it's enriching, it's a little bit self-nourishing and it's selfish in a, in a sense. And if you like talking like yeah. <laughs> But I, but I also think it gives opportunity to, to you have a platform now to have other and give people a platform to share their story, much like we're doing with you today, which, I, again, stoked to have you here because I think there's some very valuable things that you can contribute um, at a couple of different levels. Well, a lot of different levels, but there's a there's a couple things I'd, I definitely want to dig into. Uh, one of those, obviously, is is the the world of fitness and how it fits in. Uh, to your life, but also your clients' lives and the impact that you're having and making with people. And then also one of the things, you know, you're a, you're a huge advocate for the, the stronger than stigma movement, um, as we just kind of, you just kind of alluded to the mental and emotional health and want to dig into that as well. But look, you, uh, you're, a, you're a physical therapist, but you're also a coach and strength training is a huge part of your life. Um, and it, you know, from a physical perspective, also from obviously from a business perspective, and uh, maybe you could just kind of walk us through your, 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 your journey a little bit, like a lot of us that get into coaching athletics fits in generally somewhere we had, we had a, we had an experience. Um, we enjoyed it. Some of us excelled, some of us didn't, uh, we all struggled at some point. And a lot of times there's in part of that story there's a tipping point where the sport gets taken away from you. You get injured. You have a bad experience, uh, whatever the case. Uh, but I'd like to know, like, is that how you got here? Is that what started it? Are you one of those guys, or are you? Is this a random story that we're gonna we're about to hear? No, it's not random. It's uh, <laughs> my my story is growing up playing. A lot of basketball. Basketball is still my favorite sport, although I don't think I've shot a basketball in at least a year now. Um, but yeah, I think having a realization, you know, very quickly once I got into high school that, you know, I wasn't going to be a division one or professional basketball player, you know, regardless of what my grandma had been telling me since I was six years old. <laughs> um, and also finding uh, like my sophomore year of high school, I took a weight training class. And then I took another weight training class my senior year and just realizing that I have, I think, a story that's similar to a lot of strength coaches is that I actually I liked being in the weight room more than I liked being on the court. Mm. Um, and I was maybe that's because I was better at it. You know, I, I was I performed you better excelled. in the gym than I was on the basketball court at mm-hmm. that point. They'll you know, be in like the ninth guy off the bench. Um, and so I just love lifting like I'd always kind of as a basketball fan. I'd always been sort of drawn to those guys who had like the physique that looked almost like a bodybuilder on the basketball court, mm. like a David Robinson. Yeah, right. Like the Shoulders one. on that guy. Insane. Yeah, wow. The Admiral. Yeah. And so, yeah, the weight training class kind of opened my eyes to my joy of lifting and wanting to stick 
close to sports in some way. I was trying to figure out, you know, junior, senior year in high school, like, what am I going to do as a career? And got introduced to physical therapy through a friend. Um, his mom was a PT. And so I decided to go to University of Puget Sound, study exercise science um, and pre-PT and just kept training. I, I ran a couple years of track and field in college, but again, like the weight room was just where I wanted to be, you know, curls didn't help me long yeah. jump, but that's what I wanted. <laughs> that's to a do. very specific type of strength training. Yeah. And, and we didn't have a strength coach. Like I wasn't doing anything to help myself on the track at that point. Um, and so, yeah, that, then that's kind of my story. And then, um, during that program, we got to go to like some national ACSM conferences. Mm -hmm. And I remember being introduced to this, the theme, I think it was my sophomore year in college, the theme of the ACSM national conference was exercise as medicine. And then that has sort of been like my North star ever since. So now 11 years, 12 years later, like exercise as medicine is still kind of like my right. guiding light. The thing that I keep coming back to why I believe in physical therapy why I believe in the power of, of exercise, physical activity, sport, all this stuff mm -hmm. being way more than, you know, just a recreational hobby or a leisure time, you know, privilege. It gets extremely important for our health. Um, and so that, yeah, that has been, and then to narrow down, I would say I'm drawn to strength training. Like I compete in powerlifting. And so, you know, there's, one of the things about the fitness industry, and we can talk about this, I'm sure we will, and you've seen it, we were talking about it before, about integrated health and fitness right. is it becomes competitive. As if the pie is so small that we have to compete for our piece. And the pie is like enormous. It's the whole world of unhealthy people. It's massive. Like, it, like the pie is, and we can make it bigger. Like we can get more people in the pie getting healthier. It is so hot and juicy and looking so good right now yeah. if you're in the industry. Oh, yeah. I mean, after everything we've come through. Yeah. And oh, my yet, God. And yet it's like hot and juicy and gigantic. And yet we're like, hey, that's my fucking corner we're, of the pie. Like, get out of here. We're still fighting. Over yeah, it. I'm like trying to stab someone. Like, you know, people are trying to stab each other with their fitness forks. And it's stupid. And so um, I think for me, the, the sort of corner of fitness where I'm the most passionate is strength strength training mm -hmm. doesn't mean that I think everyone should compete in barbell sports, but I think most people are under trained, under loaded, whether that's in the mm. big box gym or per, especially in rehab, mm. um, people are under loaded and people are generally weak. Let's, let's talk about that for a second because it's interesting that you made that correlation or made that, sorry, that connection, not correlation, that connection very early on. I, I, I want to talk about, or I want to ask you, so I, I work with a lot. We have, so at, at Red Dot Fitness, we actually have an internship program with the local university with San Jose State. And so we get, we get a lot of interns that come through. Um, it, it, it spawned from my partner CC's relationship with CC, with, sorry, with San Jose State. She was a, 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 t a tenure track professor there um, before moving into the world of a personal training, in like an undergraduate yep. exercise yeah, and, physiology, no, and, and as a in athletic training. Okay. So, uh, the point of that is, is we get these interns coming in, and they're pre physical therapy, right? And they're they're going through this program, and they <laughs> they some of them have had some experience, you know, with physical th therapy. That is, they had a knee thing, or they had an ankle thing, or whatever. They had a brother or sister that went through it, and they thought that would be really cool. And they're by the time they get to us, they're 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 a ways into their educational, you know, journey. And they're, they still really don't know kind of what goes on in a physical therapy clinic. They've had their little experience, whatever, whatever it was, but oftentimes they get all the way through and they find how disillusioned they were about what physical therapy and the business of physical therapy is. And they're ill-equipped to kind of make decisions like you were with, Hey, it doesn't like there's the clinical side and we'll get into this, but there's also this, um, there's also this side as a, as a therapist or where you can coach people, right. And you can augment their programs beyond the shoulder thing or the knee thing to help people not just get over that and get back to functionality at some level, but be better at the end and keep taking it to, to a different level. You kind of, you, you got in, you were again, huge into, into weight training before you mentioned that, 
and then you you saw where you could bridge this gap between the clinical side and the exercise side and i heard you kind of allude to uh saying that we i've heard before which is heal the body and fix that is it'll fix the disease you know sort of so to speak and strength training and we can talk about this but the benefits of strength training as it relates to human health and performance are irrefutable that you just the evidence is there we can't we, we can't we can't refute that so wh- when you were going through your journey what were there any like major surprises that you ran into go in in the world of physical therapy there was like whoa this is not what i thought it was and if yeah. so what yeah so that sort of this will turn into a conversation about my personal history of mental health uh, struggles. So when I went into physical therapy school, like I said, because I thought it would be a way to stick around athletics in some way, shape or form. And so when I finished, so PT school for me, and, and I will, I'll back up a little bit. There are certainly difficulties, I think in general clinical settings with underloading of patients and just, you know, not having, literally not having the equipment or necessarily the knowledge about how to progress like a strength training program. Mm-hmm. That That's partly due to insurance limitations. Like what part of the body will you even get paid to treat? Mm-hmm. It's based on the prescription that came over from the doctor. Like if someone comes over for with a diagnosis of neck pain to evaluate and treat, you can't be like, let's do full body strength training. You're like, well, that's denied. <laughs> <laughs> which which we this person really can't do that. Which this person could benefit by yeah. greatly. Which is an argument the, towards the, the integrated. The cervical model. issue is a symptom of a bigger problem. Of yeah, right? with glutes and you know, yeah, all, blah, 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 blah. all kinds of things. But right? um, yeah, so and then physical therapy also like it is really diverse. Like physical therapy is not just what people think of with an outpatient clinic, right? It's it's people working in the ICU. It's people working in hospitals, being the first person to get someone up after a total knee. It's it's adult neuro rehab, you know, teaching people how to how to roll over in bed after a stroke when they don't have the use of one entire side of their body and they've forgotten it's there, right? They can't turn their head to the left because they don't know the left side of their body's there and the physical therapist is one of the first people to see them. And there's pediatrics. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into um, a three-year DPT program where you, the goal is to come out and be competent enough to be a first year physical therapist in any of those settings. And I think maybe down the road, physical therapy will, I don't know if physical therapy school gets longer or at some point, you know, people are able to make a decision about trying to pick sort of a track within PT school mm. after the first two years. To like be, I want to be an orthopedic sports To become specialist. more specialized. Mm-hmm. And then you don't have to take pediatrics and you don't have to take geriatrics necessarily, or at least acute care stuff. But so there, there are some structural limitations to PT school that are part of why outpatient therapists aren't great at strength and conditioning. However, I think there's lots of opportunities once you get out of school to do that. So for me, my first job out of school was outpatient orthopedics at a small community clinic in Portland, like literally across the street from the like rec center that I grew up going Mm. to close to my parents. Um, And so I moved to Portland. It was my first time back in Oregon in eight years after living in Washington for all of undergrad and grad school. Um, New girlfriend, who's now my wife, like a 30 minute commute every day and a job that did not really, it just didn't, it wasn't what I expected it to be, which was kind of your question. Yeah. What, it was, what, what, it what was, was it? Yeah. So it was very manual therapy oriented. It was very closely associated with the next door general practitioner. So it was, I'm sure it was at 95% plus referrals from doctors like it wasn't people coming in because we had they any wanted sort of to a feel specialty yeah. yeah they wanted they wanted to, they were hurting yeah. like they had a, pro- a big problem and the doctor said well i can't fix you you need to go see the physical therapist for three weeks and then come back if it doesn't work that right. kind of a thing and they're not necessarily motivated to do that outside of the fact right. that they're in pain or right. debilitated or right. can't go to work or or it's, any or it's a requirement before you can do that injection you really want or whatever um and so i was it was a it was part of a larger company so you had that sort of, you know, your performance was based on the numbers, like how many people are you seeing? If you had an opening, how, why haven't you called your 
you know, cancellation list yet. Let's squeeze someone in. Let's double book you here to make up for the missed visit this morning and all that kind of stuff. And as a new clinician, I just sort of quickly started questioning if what I was doing was the best for my patients. Was I doing the right special tests? Was my treatment effective? Was I feeling with my hands what I was told I was supposed to be feeling? Um, what do you mean, like, versus guessing? Or yeah. just the fact that well, you like, weren't even able to do it because it wasn't part of the No, the pr- it, was, it was, I could do it, but it was like when you go through school and you're like, all right, you're going to feel the transverse process of C4 and you're going to be able to tell, is it posteriorly or anteriorly rotated? Is mm-hmm. it is it shifted? Is it stuck? And you're like, I can't feel that. I don't know what I, like, I don't even know. I'm not 100% sure what vertebrae I'm on at this point. That's and I scary. certainly don't that, know. That's scary as a clinician. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I have this. Yeah. It's like, so is my diag- like, am I diagnosing this right? Am I assessing it wrong? Am I give- prescribing the right things? Like, they come in, they say they're a little better, but I can't see that they're moving that much better. So, like, now I feel like I'm pressing. And so I took a, a continuing education course for, like, the cervical spine through an organization called NIOMT, which is a big-time manual therapy, physical therapy okay. um, company. And that made me feel way worse. <laughs> Like you just you've got exposed, a professor who's a fellow. It exposed you know, all the things you, yeah, you, was like, you thought you knew, but now you really don't know. Like, you, yeah, you're telling me you're feeling that? I can't, like, <laughs> I, so then it becomes, you know, imposter syndrome sets in real quick. Mm. I feel like I shouldn't be seeing this patient, these patients, like my boss should be seeing these patients. He's managing four clinics. You know, he treats people half a day every day, and it's like the same treatment every time because he doesn't have the time. You know, he's, he's got his regulars and then he's just in there running numbers and managing other clinics. And so I didn't feel like I had the support and like the mentorship that I anticipated as a new grad. You also quickly realize that coming out of physical therapy school, I went to a private university. I still have a mountain of debt from that. And like in 2015, my starting PT salary was like 58 grand living in Portland. It was like, I literally, I can pay rent. That's and now a, all my student loans are due. All everything that's been in forbearance right now, today, right? right? Two month, a month after you start working or whatever. So it's like I don't have the lifestyle I thought I was going to have. Um, I'm trying to like see family, build a relationship with someone I'm dating who's new. Who, again, like I said, is my wife. So obviously I had high worked out high so aspirations. <laughs> um, I saw something in her, and and then I was going to work every day and being like, "Fuck, I suck at this. Mm. Like I suck at this." And so within, I started in August and by January I was depressed. And like I went to see just, I literally went to go see a primary care doctor just because I had an established care since I moved back to Portland. Right. And this is part of the process. Yeah. If you want to get treatment. I filled out that little depression screen. It was like, yeah, I'm not enjoying things that I used to enjoy. Like, yes, I am feeling anxious. And like that turned into a consult, you know, with like a general, um, I don't know, maybe a psychologist therapist or yeah. therapist. And so Who, that was like, whoever this insurance company said you needed to see next. Yeah. Right? Which of course turned out to be someone who was out of network by accident. So then like <laughs> more bills, three months later after talking to this dude who once again, it was like, he had like a Freudian approach. So I went from being like, I think I'm just really anxious at work to being like, what is my relationship with my mother? Do I have friends? I was like, fuck, <laughs> everything's wrong, apparently. Wow. And then I got like, you know, $1,500 bill because I'm out of network. So right. And you feel worse. I feel worse. Um, and so that was like, it started in January and in, I think I want to say it was July, I made a, a suicide attempt. So it was very fast. Um, and... So yeah, that was not what I was expecting coming out of PT school to like get this job I'd been basically training for for eight years since I started. It's why I picked the college I picked was because it was a track to PT school at a school that had a PT school. Um, and so, yeah, I, I stopped working. Uh, I like moved home for a few months. It got worse because I had even less direction. Like I didn't, I was like, do I need to go back and read my textbooks again. Did I somehow cheat my way through PT school? Did I not wow. learn what I thought I learned? A lot of questions. Like, am I just, and that, and so for me, like depression and anxiety, I never experienced it before. Luckily I haven't experienced it since, but for me, what it was, was I felt like I could not stop thinking. 
couldn't get out I of would sight literally of ask people like, are, do you feel like you're thinking all the time? Or like, do you get breaks from thinking? Cause I couldn't get my brain and it was just all negative. Like it, it was all negative and I still feel like I'm always thinking, but it's about what's going on. I was distracted in my own head for like s- nine straight months. And that's why I felt like there was no way out other than to just like, you know, delete myself permanently. That's, I mean, that is a drastic, obviously how it has to be. I can't yet, I can't even imagine. And and unfortunately I have been, had people close to me that have suffered and struggled and attempted and some successful. Uh, You covered a lot of things right there, man. And I just wonder, you know, and you kind of started with the whole, this really kind of started with the school, right, and the and the education track to help people and and do good things, and you trust that the place that you're going and the people you're listening to and the tests you take and the the you know, the clinical hours or observation hours, you know, that you do are going to prepare you for this. Only to to find out, like you, this isn't this isn't the case at all. And again, saddled with debt and questions and and things like that. I wonder. I wonder how common this is in people in in general, but specifically in you know on the on the, on the track to work in medicine or as a clinician somewhere where your somebody's health at the end of the day is in your in your hands. And obviously, it's different for you now, you know, than it was then. But did you come across anybody else that you know in your was I assume this was all very private, right? But did you sense have you come across anybody else sort of on that track, and you know that 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 went through the same thing and well, I mean, totally relate to. I, I was not to the extent that I went through it, but you know, I've had classmates who, you know, at the time, like I was reaching out, just like seeing how people were doing, and and you know, because I wanted to to know if they were dealing with anything similar to what I was dealing with, and I think most people get out of PT school and like you get that, like I didn't know what I didn't know, mm, and, right? And it just hits you some people harder and some people not as hard. Yep, I think okay, it depends fair. on. Mm-hmm. Like my wife finished PT school at the same time as I did. And her first clinic was just totally different. Like she had a clinical director who went out of his way to mm. offer mentorship, to check in, like, how is the schedule? Like, do we need to lighten it, the load your first month versus like, how soon can you have a full schedule? Um, and I, and I talked to professors and, and yeah, I think it is fairly common that people get through whatever type of medical schooling it is. Well, I mean, I think there's some sort of damning statistics about like mental health and suicide rates for different like dentists and certain other medical professionals. But yeah, I I think for, for me, it was that I had, well, one of the things that was super hard, and I think this probably spans across any profession that takes more than just an undergraduate degree is that I've, I'd been in school from the age of your whole three, life, three, your whole life. Yeah. till yeah. I was 25 and I'd had a syllabus. It was structure. Yeah. I knew when the tests were, I knew what the material was. I knew what pages I had to read. You right? knew what you I knew what the practical exam was going to be. You're sort of told like, here's what's going to be on the test. Yeah. Know this. Yeah. And then even, even in your internships, you've got a clinical instructor Mm -hmm. who's there every day, kind of helping you figure out what to do with your patients. You've got performance reviews, you've got little tasks you've got to do for school while you're there. And then all of a sudden, like you graduate and it's just that all that, like all the strings get cut and like you're a, you know, you're the, you're Pinocchio with no strings anymore. You're like, I can do whatever I want. And you're like, holy shit, I can do whatever I want. Like, I don't know what to do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so let me ask you this. I mean, and so this is just I'm gonna be really blunt about it. Looking back um, and you, I mean, this got really dark, really dark for you. Looking back now, having coming out the, out the other side and having a much higher level of awareness, was there, were there things that you missed that you could have done looking back? And now you go, why didn't I, why didn't I seek more, uh, clinical time? Why didn't I seek out a mentor? Why didn't I do those? Uh, did those things, have those things come up and what answers have you come up with? Because I'm trying to get to what about all these other people that are suffering, mm-hmm. right? That we don't know about, or maybe we do, but we, 
We don't, right? They're going through this pro- this this process, and it, it you're, we're talking about physical therapy, you know, school. It could be anything, and but they're they're trusting the people that are in front of them. They're trusting that process to get them to be to get to the other end. What were the what were things that you look back on to go, man? If I had done a little bit more of this, right, or if I had been a little bit more of a self advocate for myself, or if I had seen the writing on the wall, like I would have known whether those things. Well, I think one thing is, and this is something I would advocate for, for sure, for new physical therapists, like don't be afraid to quit your first job. Wow. Yeah. You know, like it was not the right setting Fit. for me, mm-hmm. but it was also, again, my first job. Like, what do I know? Maybe this is, maybe this yeah. is the right job and I suck. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. And, and you got 50 K freaking, <laughs> I got almost $200,000 worth of student loans right. that just, yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm making okay money. I right. don't know what else is out there. But I can't yeah. stop because I can't, I have to pay my loans. Right. I'm paying rent now more than I ever have. Feel trapped. And again, it's like, yeah, it's my first job. It's what I've been again, working towards for eight years, plus all the other years of school before that. Suck it up, David. And so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And so I think, you know, trusting your gut there, knowing that there's other jobs, you know, it's not great to, I'm not saying give it a month and then if you just don't like it, leave, you know, put in the effort, but you'll kind of know. So I would have left, me now would have left that job way faster. Mm. Um, I also think that I was really committed to not just the goal of becoming a physical therapist, but I'd sort of predetermined, you know, I was going to be an outpatient orthopedic physical therapist. And what I did, that was the expectation on myself. Mm -hmm. And I loved the therapeutic exercise component of my education. We had an awesome professor. He was ex Green Beret. So he taught us higher level stuff than I think most PTs get, which on the f- on the other side of the coin can be a bit of an issue in a really general outpatient clinic where you're getting chronic right. pain, rotator cuff tears, right. you know, 80, hip replacement. 85 hip replacement. Like right. I can't do a lunge with a, you know, right. med ball chop with you. Like it's I'm very trying mundane. to get you to ro- like yeah. stand up yeah. or like literally just get your pain from a nine to a seven. Yeah. Um, so I love the therapeutic exercise, but as far as my clinical rotations went, if I look back, I didn't feel super confident in my outpatient orthopedic rotation. It was not my favorite. It was a lot of, so it, Within physical therapy, I think that's the area where you're the most responsible for the most aspects of your patient. You have to diagnose them. They come with just, they have neck pain. And then the expectation is you figure out what's causing that neck pain. And you're really managing a lot. And you've got, you know, the psychological factors, you've got their lifestyle, you've got their family stressors and all these things that you kind of, you learn can be a factor in PT school, but you don't get a lot of how do I Practical application, right. Yeah, you get the, like, I know this exists, but I don't know exactly how to have that, have that conversation. And I'm 25 years old and I don't, I literally don't understand what you're going through. So I, I don't, it, I can be empathetic, but you're going to kind of see through that. And so what I liked the most was my geriatrics. Like I liked working with older people. Mm. I liked working actually in like a skilled nursing setting where they were there for a diagno- a very specific diagnosis. Like this is a 93 year old who had pneumonia. Right, we got this. There's a protocol. Like I, we know the PT's job is like I just need to recondition them. Right. Like right now they can't stand up. I can figure that out. Mm-hmm. And the doctor will make sure they don't die. Right. Right. And the nurses the are there. Yeah. Yeah. And the speech therapist is helping them with their swallowing, and the OT is helping them get dressed. And I'm there to get them stronger and get them walking again. And so it was just a it was complex patients, simple treatment, versus outpatient orthopedics is often simple diagnosis, rotator cuff tear, simple, but the treatment can be pretty complex or just shoulder pain, shoulder pain. Don't know why it started. Can't really tell you when it started. Can't really tell you what aggravates it, what makes it better, but I want you to fix it. I don't know what that's a long process, but insurance is paying for three weeks worth of physical therapy. Yeah. Right. And and you've got to see three people in an hour. Yeah. And so I think I kind of, I kind of assumed I was a round peg, Mm-hmm. even though I enjoyed the square hole of geriatrics. And so I just shoved myself into something else. And what I eventually did after going through a lot of treatment for the mental health was the first thing I did was I got a job at a skilled nursing facility. I contacted my old clinical instructor. Which and is what you wanted to do. As a, as a right. PRN therapist, I got three days a week. 
And then I was like, you know, I really love the exercise side. And so I found, I started looking at like private, smaller gyms. You know, I didn't want to go to 24 hour fitness, but I found a small gym that happened to be an integrated health and fitness center that a friend recommended. He's like, oh yeah, I go here for chiropractic care. You should talk to the owner. And they're like, you're a physical therapist that wants to work here as a coach? Like, right. you're hired. <laughs> right. So then I got to work with active, healthy people doing mm-hmm. the type of exercise that I loved. And then as a clinician, I got to work with geriatrics, which to me was much simpler. It made sense. I kind of got back to having that plan, that structure, the framework. They're going to be here for 30 days. These three goals, roll over independently, stand up with minimal assist, walk 150 right. feet. Right. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. And so that's that was kind of my gateway back into working and like getting my head right. Again, covered just you covered a lot of things right there. I think this is so relatable though, obviously to physical therapy, it's directly relatable, but I think it's relatable to coaching as well. Uh, you know, when, when if there's a new coach on the on the fitness health general health and fitness side of things that's trying to break into the to the business, trying to make a career change or is coming out of school and wants to move into to coaching. And the processes that you have to go through or that you need to go through in order to learn what you don't know, you know, and have those have those experiences. So the practical application um, then brings this newfound knowledge and then brings that over time you're putting in that time, you're gaining some more wisdom and you're able to make decisions. But the other thing that you covered there was the fact that it doesn't have to be from school to an outpatient clinic like you went to. Um, if that's what you want to do, then, then go do it. But don't don't assume that that's what you have to do. You just kind of outlined a couple of things. And I, we, we were talking a little bit before. There are so many different avenues for physical therapists to work in. Right. And it doesn't have to be one thing. Um, and this is kind of taking it to a little bit different level in terms of um, how and you mentioned, like there's an OT that was working on the on, on certain things with this patient. There was the, the doctor who was who was working on the the, the primary diagnosis the pri- yeah. and the nurses who are supporting that. Yeah, so you had this team, mm-hmm. right? You had this team and they all were in a position to, to do the things that they do really well and more importantly, do the things they love doing. Like, it's not to say that there's not stuff in there you don't like doing, but you are helping a person in a way that you want to help them and you feel like you're giving them the things that they need. It's the same in coaching, right? You, you don't have to be pigeonholed into one thing. It might mean you need to spend a little time somewhere in order to, to get out of that pigeonhole, right? But at the same time, staying there is an is 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 an is not a must. You have an option. I guess my point is is moving into this integrated setting. Uh, now you're working with this team of people that are all respecting one another, and you do this, and this is your role here with this person, and this is your role here with this person. And uh, you shared with me earlier, you're moving into a new a new setting that that's set up like that. Talk talk to me about this, this transition or this change that you're making? Yeah. So since my wife and I moved out to Phoenix in September, I've sort of been piecing together, working as a coach at a powerlifting gym, working in some skilled nursing settings, kind of trying my hand at home health, realizing that's terrible um, and looking for a job that would be a really good fit that I would want to stay at for a long time. Um, either that or creating it for myself. So I've, I've also been th- for a long time, I was thinking I was going to set up like a cash based practice out of the gym. Mm -hmm. And then this, that's no easy task, by the way. No, no, it was going to be kind of a side thing. And it would hopefully have kind of grown like we talked about before the show. It was going to be a situation where I was going to sort of hedge to not have a a ton of pressure and it'd be the only thing I was doing and then let it grow as it sort of demanded to grow. Mm -hmm. However, then this opportunity with a company called Backfit presented itself. So it's called Backfit Health and Spine. It's, I think they're very new. I literally had my first day of training yesterday. So I may, anyone anyone listening can fact check me on the company. (laughs) Um, They're mostly here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I think they've got close to 10 locations in the Valley. Um, They've also expanded, I I believe out into a couple different States and they're looking to grow. It was started by a brother and sister who were both or who are both chiropractors. Okay. But their model is, under one roof, they'll have chiropractic, physical therapy, they have a PA, they do imaging on site, they do injections on site, PRP, um, Synvisc, all this kind of stuff. So one stop uh, shop. One stop shop, massage. They've got another company, like a sister company called um, 
Arizona pain specialists. So they've got two physicians who are pain specialists. Pain, pain, yeah, pain management specialists. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They do manipulations under anesthesia. They do all kinds of stuff. Um, and so you'll have a we have what we'll have is a patient that'll come in and they may start with 15 minutes with the chiropractor to get like a cervical and thoracic adjustment. And maybe they get referred to the chiropractor for first. And after two to three weeks, they realize, you know, you're getting a little better, but like we want to have you see our physical therapist for a more thorough movement analysis and like to figure out, you know, how do we utilize exercise to support what we're doing from a manual therapy standpoint as a chiropractor. So then they get referred to the physical therapist. They may also get referred to the PA. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, this is a knee thing. Like, let's get an x-ray of your knee. It's like right down the hall. Mm-hmm. Like you already paid your copay. You don't have to pay for this again. Go get an x-ray. Like maybe you need a synvisc injection. And then that's going to allow you to participate better with physical therapy. And then, you know, once a week at least, all the practitioners sit down over like an extended lunch. And we talk about the Mrs. A, Mr. B, how are they doing? You know, how many visits have they had? How's their insurance looking? Like how'd they respond to that injection that we tried last week? Anything else we can do for them? Do we need to refer them to the pain specialist because it's been three months and they they went from an eight to a seven, but that's not good enough. And so I'm really excited about that. And I kind of got exposed to something similar to that in Portland when I was working with Mike at Evolution because that was under one roof. On one side of the building, it was physical therapy, chiropractic, massage, a naturopathic physician, an acupuncturist. Yeah. Um, And I think that's it. And then on the other side, it was a gym. So the got PTs everything. would bring in, or the chiropractor, sports chiropractor, would walk down the hall, open the door into this huge gym space, and they'd do their, their exercise rehab in there, introduce them to one of the coaches. And so then we'd refer, we'd cross-refer back and forth, or you'd, you'd get your blood draw, and you'd, you'd do your, your testing with the naturopath to figure out if there was something else going on in your gut, mm-hmm. and that's why you were having this low back pain. And all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's the future, honestly, like a utopian view of the future of real health. I hope it is. And it, this leads into, you know, the a, a bigger topic. But I have seen this attempted in the past. And it's very seldom that I actually see these things in the past. I have seen them a little bit as of late working. And you're, you're sort of describing this example. And the, the, the problems I've seen all center around ego and that is when you put all the smart people in one room and they are have their own agendas and they're in there for the wrong reasons that is i'm in there to make money um and i'm not putting the people first i'm putting the product first uh then those pieces of paper that are hanging on the wall people start to argue and they start to there's there's friction about well I should be in charge of this or, you know, no, we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it this way because this is my course of practice and this is my lane and you're getting out of your lane and getting into my lane. And then all of a sudden we're not taking care of the patient anymore. We're worried about protecting ourselves and, and who's right and who's wrong versus helping the patient or the, 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 the client altogether. I think, um, again, speaks to a larger topic of us all getting along and why we, as what we've experienced sort of as an industry, and I'm gonna talk about the coaching specific industry uh, or, or the gym industry or the personal training studio industry, the things that we ran into in the last year in terms of us not, are being deemed in a, non-essential. And there's a lot of reasons that why, and, and to be clear, it's just not an argument about whether we, we should have shut things down or had, you know, that we shouldn't have been very careful. You know, obviously there's some stuff going on, right? Things are, this virus is spreading very fast. We need to get a hold of this thing. We need to figure out some things first and then make some decisions. But so it's not about whether or not places or facilities should have been shut down, but it's more about why there wasn't ever a conversation at any level from any person, not in the media, not from a government perspective, not that I want the government involved in fitness. But my point being is there was nothing said or nothing talked about with regard to how that being healthy is essential. And, and there are things that you can be doing to become healthier and help yourself to not be a burden, to not burden the system, to not get sick, potentially not get sick. And again, a lot of that evidence is there. But the bigger thing was the ego. 
Like we just need to drop the freaking ego. And if we can do that first, then we can start having a conversation as a, as an industry um, and start to bridge the gap between healthcare and fitness, which I heard you say earlier, maybe it was before we were, we were actually recording here, which is your goal, right? Is, is to do that. And that's, that's, that's been your, your thing. Let's talk about, let's talk about why in America, and I would say in most places in the world, fitness has been deemed non-essential. Um, I know this is something you're passionate about and, and there's some things I think we could be doing better, but I'm just curious to know kind of what comes to mind first for you. Yeah. Well, so first of all, shout out, I think it was Kevin Mullins, right? Who mm-hmm. wrote the, the article for PPSC, which is kind of spawned this conversation. Yeah. yeah. Why fitness isn't essential in America. Um, well, so, I mean, I think it speaks to a larger systemic, just human issue, which is that we tend not to, uh, like we have, we have a unique ability to sort of predict the future. I think as like living beings, I believe we're the only ones who can sort of think out into the future and predict how our actions will impact our future selves and all this other stuff. But, um, we tend not to do anything about that until there's a catastrophe. And then we respond to the catastrophic event. So like getting in shape wasn't the answer to COVID in March of 2020. No, the damage is done. Right. And you know, that was social distancing. That was, you know, trying to rapidly develop a vaccine, all these other, just like you're not going to exercise yourself out of polio. It's a knee jerk reaction. Yeah. But as we saw time and time again, like the people who were the healthiest before they got sick were the healthiest after they got sick. They had the, for the most part, obviously there's always outliers, but people who were physically healthy, emotionally healthy, probably didn't hurt either because it's all tied together. They had less severe cases. And so one thing that I thought was really interesting was someone talking about in the media, you know, you see the death toll, the count, like the ticker, all but the you time. don't see the survivor ticker. And like what would have been really beneficial and what would still be beneficial was to you know, get a huge sampling of people who had extremely mild or asymptomatic positive cases. Like, what are your characteristics? How do we get a population full of you guys? Nobody's even asking that question. Yeah, uh, there's no money in that. But, right. It's not sexy. Uh, and it does. But, it's not a headline either. Yeah, yeah. And so, I think the reason fitness isn't essential is in part because fitness is not a quick fix, and that's what most people want. Fitness does not check a catastrophic box box right right you gotta start you don't i mean it's like physical therapy or or personal training like you start you start going to a trainer when you're finally like well now i'm a hundred pounds overweight right or There's now a tipping i really point. hate like i've never liked how i look in the mirror now I hate but myself. now i hate it right now i should work with a trainer you know my shoulder pain's been bad now it's really bad now i should go see a physical therapist but it's been five years of this going on. And now I've, you know, I've slowly stopped hiking, walking, running. The emotional and now driver. I, yeah, and now yeah. it's like, now it hurts to grab the thing off the top shelf. Now I'll go. Um, and, uh, you know, in listening to your your first episode of your podcast yesterday, you, you, you have a lot more, like you're a lot more tenured in the fitness industry than I am. But it's, it's new. Like it's a very new industry. Oh yeah. And like you were saying, you know, 20 years ago, you were either a group fitness instructor mm-hmm. or you trained for bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Like that was, neither of those are essential. Nope. Not everybody needs to be a bodybuilder. Nope. And not everyone needs to be able to do a 60 minute spin class. And there's good you in both I mean? of those things, but they were very, very limited. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's still what Stigma. most people think of when they think of the gym. Like most people think of, you know, exercise as like, a privilege you know most people don't have time like how am i going to go to the gym when i'm a single mother with three jobs but you like i don't know it's just uh i'm all over the place with this answer but i think that's why fitness isn't essential is because it is not like fitness is typically thought of as i want six-pack abs Mm -hmm. right i want to go somewhere and sweat uh fitness is bodybuilding fitness is powerlifting, like fitness is 
running a marathon right. and it's not it's not considered a part of like a healthy lifestyle so it's physical activity is essential it doesn't have to be lifting weights it could be walking and what we were talking about earlier with like the giant pie full of sick people is what it really is mm-hmm. there's plenty of those um most people like the vast majority of people don't meet the minimum basic recommendations right. for physical activity which is 150 minutes of moderate activity which it's, is it's three 10 minute walks it's exactly five days a week do the math and people don't do that right um so it's clearly not essential so i, I mean i don't necessarily know the answer but it, you know we don't market ourselves whether it's via instagram or whatever like nobody's marketing fitness as like the answer to high cholesterol nobody's really marketing fitness as like this is how you um like start training when you're 40 and you won't need to move into an assisted living facility when you're 80. you won't have to be afraid of the stairs that go up down to your basement and i've worked in geriatrics like i said i've had so many patients who are like yeah i have a two-story house but i, don't, I haven't gone upstairs in 10 years like i'm afraid i'd fall it's, it's, it's crazy. crazy like they're literally not strong enough um, and this is the house they work their whole life to own and have and yeah. get old and die in. And, and they've they... mistaken independence for isolation. And that's a whole other conversation right. about aging. But yeah, I think, you know, fitness is framed again as like come in and get ripped. Like, and that's the marketing, right? Come in and lose 10 pounds, like blah, blah, blah. And that's great. Like those things are good. Like it, if you're ripped, you're probably healthier physically. Um, but Maybe. It's, just, it's just not spoken about in a way that makes it essential. The truth of the matter is, is that there, you know, America is in a health crisis, right? Massive health crisis. And, and it's not the pandemic that we're talking about. It's it's things like cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, uh, diabetes, depression. anxiety, exactly. Anxiety, depression. And all of that has been exacerbated in this last year. And nobody is talking about it. Going back to your ticker and the numbers and the numbers game, at least the way it's been represented. And obviously trust has been broken you know what are we really looking at here how do you really interpret this uh you know where are you getting your information from who's right who's wrong what side of the aisle is this coming from because if it's coming from this side of the aisle then it's uh, it's it's evil and if it's coming from that side of the aisle who did that scientist vote for last year right who gives exactly affect their work a thousand but thousand percent And, and and unfortunately again it's not been positioned it's not been positioned in a way that makes a lot of sense to somebody longer term in terms of preventing this health crisis. And the bottom line is there are a lot of answers. And there's, again, there's so much evidence, there's so much research to show that just the things that we've listed off there can all be combated or turned around, you know, and in some cases prevented and cured through a healthy lifestyle, which needs to include exercise. Uh, That we're not the, we're not, I heard you say this, I think we're not really built to exercise. Like, oh, right. You, maybe, maybe you can expand on that. Yeah. There was a book. I, I, I'd have to go back and look up the title, but it was, it was, it was a journalist who'd done a bunch of research about why is it so hard to form an exercise habit? And it's because evolutionarily we weren't meant to seek out opportunities to like frivolously burn up our calories. Right. We were meant to be, do as little as possible in the very few, very few times that we could do very little, like as cavemen or before, yeah, or like even, your, even 300 years ago. It's like your dog or cat at home, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, I, I this sleep. is the, yeah, I don't have to hunt today. <laughs> right. Like I'm not going to do burpees. That's a privilege. And squat this rock. Right. Like I'm exhausted. <laughs> um, and, and there's probably a famine coming. So like, I should probably try and, you know, put on a little bit of body fat for the winter, you know, when the elk are gone. And we adapted to this. Yeah. And like, we can't, find berries anymore and so yeah it's like we're hard goes against we're, our entire evolution right. to go to the gym we're hard-coded to yeah to resist this yeah until you start though and i think that's the other side mm-hmm. it's really hard to start an exercise habit but then there's a bunch of evolution that makes it easier to keep that habit because we're rewarded for being physically active like we're rewarded on a hormonal level on a neurological level we have community, which is humongous. Like that's probably more important than fitness in the last 15 months is like the loss of community. Like 
I don't care if you go to the gym or if you like go to a freaking book club. Like no one's had friends. <laughs> a sense of belonging. <laughs> a sense yeah, of a, belonging yeah. and community. Like that's another survival mechanism. If you were alone up until like 200 years ago or 500 years ago, if you were alone, you're probably going to die. Uh, we just we just had a uh, we just had a neuroscience researcher in the other day, and we were talking about that very thing: community and social engagement, and how important it is for brain health and performance. And these are things we're not even talking about. I mean, and again, the, the research is there and how important it is for people to engage. And we innately know it. We know this. Yeah, we, we, we absolutely know this. Uh, isolation, and I think you mentioned, you just mentioned that a minute ago, but isolation is one of the worst things we can do for ourselves. It's, it's a torture device. And like maybe, it's what you do for prisoners who are behaving poorly. Put them in isolation. Go back to, I mean, was when, when you were going through your, your depression, isolation seems like the right thing to do. I think a lot of the time I've, I've suffered myself at times, certainly maybe not to the extent that, that you have, but you don't want to be around people for a couple different reasons, right? You don't want to be around them because you don't, for me, it was, I don't just want to be a bummer to everybody else. Right. I don't want to bring I'm letting people down, you know, and I just don't want to be, or I feel and I hear myself being negative. Like the things in my head are coming out of my mouth. And I can see the looks and the faces of the people that, that they're hearing this, which just is making me feel worse about myself. And it just feels better to be alone. You go, I'm sure oh, yeah. you experienced that. I feel like I had nothing to contribute. Right. And, it, and when you did, it wasn't, wasn't worth, worth anything. Right. Right. Uh, it's such a tough place to be. Yet we were forced into this and we're looking for outlets. We're looking for, uh, for ways to, to be, to, to have community and, Look, fitness for a lot of people, their fitness community, whether, and again, community is a often, I think, misguided or used term. Just because you show up to a place where there's a lot of people doesn't mean you're a member of community. Right. And just because you're doing the same workout as the person next to you on the bike or the treadmill or whatever, and you're both sweating and in front of that instructor and there's lights and music and you know there's that this energy that's being uh, shared by everybody doesn't necessarily mean community it means you're in the same room getting hot and sweaty together but there really isn't a connection to it tell me about that connection well i feel connected to the instructor but i don't even i know the instructor's name but that instructor doesn't know my name right i feel connected to the music it makes me feel good so we're having all these sensory things coming in but we're from the from the brain's perspective we're not actually socially we're not actually engaging anybody it's more of a distraction than than anything else yeah so We've got this, you, you, again, going back to the mental health component uh, of this, uh, where we are right now and what we're coming out of and the things that we're going to discover. We're already discovering them, but the things that we're going to discover. And again, talk a little bit about this back to the, um, the stronger than stigma, but it's awful. We've seen a, we've seen a huge uptick. It was interesting because in the beginning of 2020, there wasn't really an uptick. Uh, you know, the, the the numbers were kind of even what I'm talking about is suicide rates, actually, uh, and depression rates. And they were kind of even to the previous year. And then the lockdowns happened. And then it wasn't a huge uptick right away. But then towards the end of the year, there was a massive uptick. And we don't even know. The CDC doesn't even put out their report until like, I think it's like October of this year for 2020. So we won't really even really know kind of the, the stats that they've come up with about this, about this, this epidemic, you know, that, that has been exacerbated. It's already existed. Again, I think the, 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 the things that we're seeing are a symptom, you know, of a, of a bigger problem, but I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of getting off track here, I think, but the, the sort of the going back to a, exercise being essential as it relates to how it enhances, you know, immune function and how it enhances mental health and how it enhances strength or, or, or reduces loss of loss of muscle sarcopenia, how it, it, how it, how it contributes positively to all of these things. You go back to nobody's talking about this stuff. Who, there's voices out there and they're talking about fitness and it's being related to the 10 pound weight loss or to the having abs or whatever else. What the hell has happened? Like, cause there's not like there's not smart people telling the other message, but whose fucking fault is this? Like, why are we being dismissed? Why are we not being consulted? Why, why are we sitting here having this fricking discussion when 
it is so obvious. And you're about to go work with a bunch of people that obviously get that. There are smart people, there are physicians and practitioners out there that get all this. So it's not like people don't understand. Why can't we get this right, man? Well, that's like an impossible question. I don't know. I think that part of it is probably, again, it goes back to the the origins of the fitness industry and how new it is. And I think we're still probably trying to figure out like, I'll compare it to physical therapy, to be honest, because physical therapy is also a really new profession. Like it started in, I think, World War One as basically like nurses assistants, mm -hmm. the people who got the wounded soldiers up. That's the origin of physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And in the last 15 years, it's turned into a doctorate program. Like, you know, we've gone from an undergraduate degree to a master's to a doctorate from people who just help people get up and moving and did, you know, massage and exercise to having like neuro, like neuropediatric specialists, right? Neurogeriatric we know specialists. More. Like it's in, like it's the, the, the profession has gotten super broad and like, but then at each place you can go super deep into these specialisms mm -hmm. or specialties. Specialisms isn't the word. Um, and so I think the fitness industry is even newer and the gyms are like the first, I remember the, in, in Oregon, the first gym, it was called Laprenzi's. It was like one of Jack LaLanne's friends. Mm. The gym opened in like 1954. That's one generation, right? That gym is the same age basically as my mom. My dad actually worked for Jack LaLanne in the 60s. I yeah. had a patient in California who dated Jack LaLanne <laughs> and then she outlived him. Yeah. He was 99 when I met her. So, um, the, so the, the problem point, I think the point, is, the point is, is it's not very old. No, it's right? new. And so I think we're still trying to figure this out. And so a, a huge part of the history of the fitness industry is group aerobics and bodybuilding. That's the dramatic, like that is the majority. And then strength and conditioning, like collegiate strength and conditioning, which is also super new. But people don't realize it college football teams thought if you got strong, you got slow. That was like 35 years ago. Right. They didn't even have strength coaches 35 years ago in college football. And like we've, we saw what the, the whole controversy with the women's NCAA basketball yeah, that, tournament, yeah, that was, like a was, five pound dumbbell. It's ugly. It's still, so there's still a disconnect. Yeah. Yeah. Like people don't understand the power of physical activity. And so I, I think part of it is just the marketing and the branding and the understanding, like what is, and that's, it's the same with physical therapy. What is physical therapy? I can't even exactly tell you. Most people, it's like, oh, you're the massage person, right? Could be. Like you make yeah. me exercise yeah. or you're like physical therapy. That's, that's like, that's like torture, right? And that's, like, that's just like right. when you go when you hurt. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is fitness? It's like, well, curls. Right. Like it's trying abs. to look good with a, your shirt off it's and being abs. a douche. It's butt pics. Yeah. yeah. And lots right. of tanning and, you know, being that dude from Jersey Shore like right. that, you know. Right. But but what it is is like what we know it is, is cardiovascular health, community, like what you said, all the benefits of strength training, like reduction medicine. fracture risk when yeah. you're older, the ability to. I, th I mean, part of the big thing that I've talked about with a couple people is, you know, being fit. It allows you to just do whatever you want. Hike, a kayak, more, bike, more run, vibrant, play basketball, higher soccer, quality of life, higher right? quality of life. And right. so I think what we're doing, and this may be the best answer to the question is like, where have we gone wrong? Is that like so many industries, we market what fitness is instead of why right. fitness is important. Like we're telling people come in to lose 10 pounds, but we're not saying we're not focused. We're focused this. on the product. We're not focused on the people. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what do you do in the gym versus why do you do it? How can and if I we help can get you? to why right. then people will understand much, much better. It, it's yeah. Yeah. I think that's the best answer is, is that we're focused on what we do in the gym or what you might do in the gym. Come in for a personal training or versus like come in to learn how to move pain free for the rest of your life. That'd be a better marketing. It would absolutely be better marketing because <laughs> what you're talking about is being healthy is being is is what fitness is about, right? Yeah. And it's not just fitness, abs, fitness, you know, muscles, you, those kinds of things. You're not relating that to fitness equipment, fitness, CrossFit, you know, branding, fitness, you know, uh, powerlifting. Fit. 
it's any number of those things that helps you be a healthier, more vibrant version of, of yourself. Mm -hmm. You, you, you kind of alluded to how tough it is even to define the role of the physical therapist because it's become so broad. There's a lot of pressure that comes with that. Right. And you, you mentioned that and how that impacted you, uh, you know, at a very, very deep emotional level, psychological level, like, wow, I have to know so much and I don't know all the answers. Uh, and am I failing here? Am I, am I really helping people? You could going over to the coaching side of things. If you're talking about personal training or, or coaches, whether it be a strength coach or, or whatever else, I think there's what we're running into now is people, people are getting the message. They do know they need to be healthier, right? They want to be healthier. They do have a different reason why. And they've had an, a lot of people have had experiences in the last five, 10, 15, 20 years of what fitness was or what it, you walked into a gym, you took a tour, there were 300 pieces of equipment on the floor, right? Then, you know, I had to make a commitment to how much money I was willing to pay for this. I had to decide, am I going to be using the group training or the, sorry, the group exercise classes? Cause that's going to cost me a little bit more. What's the best answer for me here? Do I want access to the pool? Do I want access to the kids club? Do I want access to all the other clubs in town? That's how fitness was being sold. And then from there, I, after I've made all those decisions and I feel like, okay, so I've, I've made what I think is the most educated, you know, decision for me to help me get fit or healthy, whatever that, whatever that is to, to fulfill my goal. Now I come back and of course everybody gets to meet with a personal trainer when they join the big gym and they go on the, the gym floor and that trainer shows me how to use 50 of those 300 pieces of equipment. Right. And then tells me all the things that I'm doing or all the ways that I'm thinking are wrong or all here's all the things that I really need to be doing which is completely different than whatever the sales guy told me. And then I get pitched a program or a package, right? To, well, if you really want the help, if you really want to, to take advantage of your investment, then you have to buy me, right? You have to pay for me and I'm gonna tell you all those things. And the reality is at the end of the day, that coach uh, is trying to do their best with what they have, right? They, they honestly think they are doing the right thing. I believe most coaches out there really think that they're, they're doing the right thing. But now we're getting clients in that are coming for a very specific reason, right? And it's because I don't want to hurt anymore. Um, I, I'm i afraid that my life or my longevity is being shortened by the fact that I am not able to do the things that I want to do. Um, and, I, you know, I don't want to wind up like my brother or my sister or my dad or my mom or, or whatever. So they're, they're coming to us with these things. And so the, the, the coach is in a situation now where they have to have a vast amount of knowledge at a very broad and deep level. And whenever you have that and whenever there's a need or a demand for that, you have people out there that are willingly going to sell that information to you or get that information to you in whatever way they can. And where we are now is the same place people with that particular in industry is the same place people are in terms of trying to find connection and they're going to the places where they're going to get it in a 15 or 30 second spot. And if it's not sexy, it doesn't sell. There's no money in it. And so what you have is you have a certain amount of coaches that are like, look, man, let's you don't have to be the expert at everything. It's OK to say that you don't know. Be in this thing for the long term, be it in for the for the for the right reasons. Make it about the people and not the product. And you're going to be in a really good you'll be in a much better position longer term. But you have to you have to commit to the to that process. Same thing you're asking your client to do. Commit to the process. But the problem is, is the voices on the other side are much louder. And what you have is this person that's, again, it's the shirtless selfie who's giving the fitness or nutrition advice, which then when we're looking at the the more educated group is looking at it just shaking their head, just going, what is this about? And then it, it creates this friction between the higher level professional that does have a broader, more deep uh, education and experience and knowledge about the things that a person should be doing, much like yourself, right? Who then is going like, I couldn't possibly think about referring my patient to one of these jackasses, right? And it's not that they're a jackass. They might be looking like a jackass because they don't know what they don't know. But those voices are, are, are so, so loud right now. How do we how do we bridge that gap? Because that's the gap you're talking about. It's the bridging the gap between fitness and the healthcare industry. How do we bridge that gap? How do we come together? How do we get the intelligent people to be louder than, I'm not gonna say they're not intelligent. 
I'm just going to say those that mean well, <laughs> but, but are making it harder for everybody. Yeah. I think part of what makes it hard for, you know, the more you know, the more you don't know. And that's true in fitness and healthcare and every industry, every area of study, right? Every time you learn something, you learn two things you didn't know. 1,000%. Or you, you get exposed to two more things you don't know, basically. And you still have to keep learning. And that's a really hard sales point, right? The, the answer of it depends is not what people want to hear. Like, they're not coming. Uh, if I take my car and I'm not going to be like, hey, what's wrong with my car? And they're like, well, it depends. Right. Like, no, just tell me. <laughs> Right. But we're not, you know, we're not a machine. So that is the right answer. And then from, from it depends, then you can extrapolate and, right. and figure out what, what it is for that person. So, But I got a lot of questions for you, and we need to go through an assessment, a diagnostic, you know, some diagnostics. Here. Yeah, right. so I think, I think the way to bridge that gap, and I think a company like, like John Russin's, like Get PPSC, is doing a good job of that. And full disclosure, that's one of the companies I work with as a coach. Right. They are creating a framework to reduce some of that complexity from a programming mm -hmm. standpoint as a coach while acknowledging the importance of having that conversation with your client about why they are there. Otherwise, you're doing a disservice. Right. Like the hu right. we are, we're all human beings with similar like our anatomy is essentially the same right a hinge is a hinge right a squat is a squat right. there's individual differences but it's not the differences between the way a person squats and the reason and their motivation for being in the gym is much like your squat is going to look more similar to the guy next to you than your motivation is and so i think it's a combination of simplifying what we actually do in the gym, which is what PPSC is great at, six foundational movements. Like you squat, you lunge, mm -hmm. you hinge, you push, you pull. These you are all carry. the basics. These are these were all all programs are based on. Yeah. Right. And then the on the opposite side is under learning and teaching coaches how to have a conversation with a client about why we're gonna do what we're gonna do. And that is the client dictating to the coach why they're going to do what they're going to do. If I don't have like, okay, so a client with kids is going to have a different motivation for being in the gym than a client who doesn't. Yeah. There's a like lot it won't, you know, if I, if I teach you how to squat and hinge, like you're not going to have back pain after you pick up your kids toys and you may continue to be able to pick up your child more as they get heavier, right? You won't have that elbow and shoulder pain that you're currently having simply because you didn't, you know, no, there's no, there's no preseason conditioning for parenthood, but that parent is not going to be motivated by the same thing as like a 21 year old college kid. Well, and and like they'll have much different capacity, different capacity. Right? Yeah. But it's really like, so that, I think that's how, that's how you get people from a quick fix. I'm in the gym for a quick fix mentality to I'm in the gym. I'm, I'm building a a healthy relationship with physical activity for the long term. Right. And that was something that was definitely exposed in the pandemic. There are gym people. Right. And there are fitness people. Right. There are people who stopped working out altogether because the, gyms the gym closed. was gone. Right. And there was the person that was like, well, this is just part of my lifestyle. But we're going to figure like, this out. I would out. love to have a barbell, but I'm going to do calisthenics in the park because we'll the park's open. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Right. Like for me and my wife, like we were in the gym six days a week. And then we lived in Northern California when this all started, everything closed. Right. It's like, okay, well, I've never run a half marathon. Like the roads are open. Let's change it up. Let's figure this out. Let's move. Yeah. And then I'm going to, so now I have a new goal and I, and I know that I can't just stop exercising because I, I feel way too good when I do it, For me, it's a habit. It's not a, how do you go to the gym six days a week? It's like, how do you not? Right. I don't know what else I would right. do. It's my, it's but my life. Yeah. Right. That, that's, that's the bridge. I think is helping people understand how building a routine around physical fitness, mm -hmm. regardless of what that is, because it could be any form of physical fitness, better than nothing, mm -hmm. and then having coaches have a deep enough understanding that they can connect that mm -hmm. to the individual person and help them highlight their goals, and then 
keep coming back. When that person gets frustrated, when they when they seem to drop off a little bit, if you were really clear on day one, it's like, remember, like you're coming in here because you want to be able to go on that like backpacking trip with your daughter before she goes to college. Like you can't, like you're not giving up on that trip, are you? Then you right. got like you got then then they'll tell you, oh, shoot, I'll be back. Right. And that's I think that's the key. Yeah, you got this. Uh, we're not trying to connect it to a piece of equipment. We're not trying to com- connect it to a, an event. We're not trying to connect it to even a exercise brand or modality. There's nothing wrong with, you know, a Peloton bike, right? Or a t- tonal or, you know, yeah. F45 or, or putting on a backpack or, and going for a walk. They're all the same. Right, they're all the same in the end, but we've tried to we've we've tried to put everything in a box and say this is the answer, this is the cure, this is the this is what I need to do in order to reach my ultimate goal, whether it be aesthetics or performance or longevity, uh, or to you know reduce my pain here or my weight or improve my cardiovascular fitness. Every single one of those things will help you. They're tools, and it's it's how they're being how they're being they're being marketed, and I think. The, the, the other when it when that starts happening when it starts to be centered around a tool or a product um, or a specific program that is more of a when I say specific programming more like a cookie cutter kind of a one size fits all you know program and I, I mentioned one or two of them in there uh, the point is is you've you're trying to sell somebody a bag of goods right and, and I don't mean that to be negative because again, all of those things are good and they can help people. They're all, they're all, they're all, they all can be part of the solution, but they're not the solution. And as a means, or as by virtue of that, when you're trying to sell people like that, then what you've done is you've taken fitness out of being essential and you've made the equipment, the program, the product being essential. And so we stop treating the client, the customer, the patient as if they're essential. And as an industry, if we want to be recognized as being essential, we have got to start treating the client, the customer, the patient as if they are essential. And the only way we can do that, the only way that's ever going to happen is if you take into account the things that you mentioned are the things that they need, the things that they want, but the reasons why they need and want those things. And that has gotten, there's there's a major, major disconnect there. And so we talk about, and again, we throw around words like community and engagement, and we're not doing any of that shit. Like, I'm sorry, staring at a a screen on your bike is, is not, while you might feel engaged, there is no social engagement there. Not from, by definition, you are engaged in your ride and the screen and the bright, shining, flashing things that are happening and the music that's in your head, but you're not really connecting with that client for the reasons that that they may need in order to achieve this healthier, healthier, longer, longer lifestyle. And what you were saying about equipment and like specific styles of exercise, whether it's like hit training or whatever you want to talk about, like you're also unfortunately then as a coach, like you're tying yourself to novelty and, and, that's you, and you're off. setting yourself right. up for the right. client to be like, well, what about this thing? What's, what's Why next? aren't we doing this other thing? You pigeonhole yourself. Yeah. But if you start with, why are you here? Like, why is the person in front of you here? Or why is the small group of people in front of you here? Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it's not, it's not uh, only for one-on-one personal training. If you tie it to that, then, th- then the what that you do is far less important. Because all you have to do is keep telling them, like you could go from hit style training to strength training to long steady state cardio, which we know a variety is almost always going to be better for the general population. Unless you're a competitive athlete, it's Mm -hmm. better to have variety. Mm -hmm. And you just keep telling them this week we're strength training because this is how you pick up your kid. Next month, we're going to start doing some cardio, right? Because you need to be able to carry that kid, right? You want to take that kid on that hiking trip that you keep telling me about. You want to go to the beach and not get exhausted. Like, cool. You can pick them up Uh, where, but where are you going to go? Right. Like you need, you need, so you just keep, you can, Build. Then you as a coach, it allows you to express your skills and your knowledge of how the human body responds to various types of exercise. 
the client doesn't need to know that. Right. They need to know that it ties back to their one or two primary overarching goals that you identified on day one. Right. And you know, that will, that could continue to evolve as you go, Forever. as you go down the path with them. Yeah. You know? They set a new goal. They're like, Hey, can you help me with this? Right. You bet. Yeah. Or, Hey, I don't know if you ever thought about this. You can suggest, I don't know mm-hmm. if you ever thought about this things that they never thought they would be capable of or right. never even crossed their mind. So it's about building that relationship and those relationships are so important. And, Again, that's kind of what this is about today is continuing to build those relationships and ho- encouraging people to build them differently with themselves, you know, around fitness and then with their fitness program, their health and wellness program. But then maybe also building the relationship between fitness and healthcare, right? Mm-hmm. And somehow finding a way to, to bridge that gap and be talking intelligently with one another and respecting one another and where we come from and making somehow making fitness part of the healthcare plan. Right. And you're working in a facility where that where that that's automatic. That's what we do here. It's all there's a this is all integrated. Uh, we have insurance systems. Right. We have healthcare, you know, companies and whatnot that that doesn't it doesn't pay them to do that. It's more work than anything else. But trying to bridge that gap means you making it somehow making it a part of the system where this is what we do. This is what you do when you come to me you know, because you have this pain or you have this disease or you have this um, malady of some kind, that conversation comes up. And you know what? I'm not going to try to teach you everything about nutrition and exercise in my 10 minute appointment with you, but I'm going to put you in front of some people that that can, and it's going to take longer than 10 minutes. Um, And somehow, you know, there's going to be some resource for you to to help you get there and and do that with this person. And here's how you do that in some direction. Well, I think So one of the things I've been thinking about recently is, you know, how to, like, we talk about bridging the gap, but like how to, how to literally build that bridge. Yeah, how do you do it? So right now, a surgeon refers to a physical Physical therapist. therapist. Yeah. That's pretty standard after most orthopedic surgeries. And I think the, that bridge has been built through physical therapy education being standardized Mm -hmm. so you can that that orthopedic surgeon trusts that the dpt they're sending them to is a dpt Mm -hmm. who went through a dpt program they have a certain level of knowledge but the physical therapist doesn't then then it stops at the physical therapist it It doesn't continue on like maybe you get a handout with some exercises at the end but nobody does those we all know that nobody does those i'm sure there's research that even supports that people don't do their home exercise programs. So I think the next bridge is from rehab professionals to fitness professionals. And, you know, part of what is probably poking holes in that, the construct or slowing the construction of that bridge is that fitness education is all over the place. It's wild. It's the wild west. You can get a a, a one week certification with a high school diploma uh, or a weekend. I don't even know how long it takes to become a personal trainer, to be honest. But the difference is between, right, like an ACE personal trainer and like a certified strength and conditioning coach is light years. With regard to what that certification requires in order Mm -hmm. to earn it and so forth. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily define the person, you know, who who might be getting those certifications, the reason they're doing it. But there's a, there's a, there's a major difference in terms of what you're learning and what you have to know. And not, not every personal trainer or not every fitness professional is going to want to, right. you know, be working with people who are coming out of the practical. rehab setting. Yeah, let's be practical. Similar to the PT. Like I, you know, I realized I didn't want to work with orthopedic patients at that time. I wanted to work in geriatric. Like there's benefit to having variety because a lot of people need training, a lot of different types of populations. But I think maybe what the next step is, is perhaps, and uh, there are some companies doing this, like Barbell Rehab, Dr. Michael Mash is a DPT. He's running certification courses to teach fitness professionals and rehab professionals how to utilize the barbell, like the big four Mm -hmm. movements, squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press, and how to scale those for rehab, or clinical athlete, or PPSE. And so what I think is, is maybe the most practical next step is for clinicians to like, it's got to start, start the I think grassroots, right? Start it's not going to be, it's not going to be, we need a s- entire change in the education process for no. fitness professionals. Cause that's not going to happen overnight, but this is like an urgent need right now. 
So I think the next step is for rehab professionals, physical therapists, chiropractors, things of that nature, to find a local gym and be like, hey, we we want to create a relationship with you guys. And like, we want to educate your training staff so that we feel confident and comfortable sending our patients to you guys afterward because we know our outcomes, like leading from a, hu- a place of humility, like we know our outcomes aren't as good as they could be. Mm-hmm. Like we need you guys. Like we don't know, I don't, we don't get exercise prescription beyond the clinical setting behind the, beyond the rehab setting. Yeah, we don't a get pe- a lot of people don't realize periodization. That, right. Like we don't get any of that kind of stuff. You, you get them six weeks worth of stuff. And yeah. And un- just enough, enough yeah. to get better enough to go back to your life and not hurt so much enough to get injured from again, a nine basically. to a seven. Yeah. 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 If you're lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's where it starts is with the rehab professionals going into the fitness settings, the small gyms with the coaches that you know, are, are probably not fresh out of school, have maybe gone through the big box gym and have realized, you know, they aren't in it for the money. They are in it to help people. So they need a place where they can really do that mm-hmm. and say, look, we want to create a relationship where we refer patients who are graduating from rehab to your gym. And then, and, and then be like, let's set up, like, let's set up three months of like once a month in services, right? right. Like here's what, here's some considerations for a total hip and a total knee patient. Here are some considerations for a rotator cuff. It's not everything. Here are some considerations for pain, right? It's not everything you need. to. Yeah. And then mostly like, don't be scared of these things. Yeah. Like they still move. You can still load this person. About a couple extra things. Yeah. And like Dr. Michael Mash, barbell rehab, they have that like strength training for the post-operative client is a course that he's developed. Like that's genius. Right. So the, the bottom line is people are doing this. They are having these conversations. They are putting themselves out there. It's it, the minority though. It's, it's the, still, like you said, it's still mostly like the, you can no, st- that get out of my, that's my lane. Yeah. I can still go to, you know, one of those places that I may have mentioned before and I can walk in the door and my, my hiring process is an audition. I don't, I might know nothing from a depth of knowledge perspective, but I've had some success with fitness in my own life and I really love it. And and I want to want to stand in front of people and, you know, and preach and help them move more and and be healthier. And again, I'm doing this because I want to, and I'm really coming from a good place, but the reality of it is, is the delivery or the mechanism for delivery is flawed. And, you know, unfortunately people are putting themselves into situations where, Again, you're moving, you're out there, you're taking responsibility for your fitness. That's great, but you need buyer beware. Mm-hmm. And so there are there are these again these organizations that are working to be better and to bridge these gaps. Um, there are a few studios. I'd like to in, in fitness facilities. I'd like to think the Red Dot Fitness is one of those. Worked really hard to build that network and those relationships to where you can refer clients and patients back and forth. And it starts with a high level of trust. You have to have the trust. And the only way to build that trust is to have that relationship. So it means you got to get out there and you got to meet some people and you got to shake some hands and you got to have some bold and some courageous conversations. And you got to drop your fucking egos and stop thinking that you know it all and stop thinking that the other guy's an idiot because he's doing this or he's not doing that. And, and and get down to get down to business and really talk about who's important. Yeah, do and, something about it. And, yeah, and it's the client, it's the patient. Yeah. And if we focus on that, we'll be in a much better place to have this conversation to bridge the gap, and have fitness be m- more essential, right? Uh, because people will feel that it's essential. You know, the consumer will feel that it's essential, and the doctor, the doctors, and the physical therapists, and the practitioners, and so forth will will respect you know, what's happening, what's happening there. And hopefully it polices itself to some extent, you know, um, over time, you know, we haven't talked about, you know, regulating it and getting, you know, sort of state regulations or governmental. I think that's a slippery slope. It's a dangerous, slippery slope, but to some extent it does need to be policed and it does. And I think, I think it could be done, you know, by the smart people and, uh, you know, the research will hopefully bring the other ones that may be a little bit more, res- um, sorry, resistant to it, sort of to the light. Uh, I think that, you know, we go back to all the things that we've sort of covered there. We talked about relationship building and we talked about community and we talked about, you know, people feeling safe and feeling like they're getting the right answers and walking into environments where this 
I am going to be taken care of here. And yes, there's some new things. We're answering questions that we've never answered before at when people are calling up, they want to know about, Hey, what's going on with the COVID protocol? I've been in this business for 25 years and this is, this is new. Um, well, we're, we have, you know, our, the cleanliness is, is a top priority for us, but that's the same shit we were doing before. You know, we were all wiping down equipment and we were all making sure we were safe and all being making sure we were taken care of. Really nothing's changed. There might be a little bit more alcohol in the bottle now, you know, and a plastic shield here. And yeah, there and all, it, yeah. And all that kind of stuff. But it really hasn't changed for those people that have really been concerned about, you know, client health and, and client safety. Um, and so, you know, again, as people are going through these processes now of coming out of, hey, I want to take responsibility for my health and I want to. I want to do better and I want to find an environment that's right for me. The questions that you, you should be asking, you know, your coach or your new physical therapist or your new doctor uh, are the same questions that that doctor and that physical therapist and that coach should be asking you, which is, why are you here? You know, what's important for you? And then why again? Like, and then, and then ask <laughs> and why the yeah, third time, right? Then ask the third a little deeper. Exactly. And ask those questions. Look, man, I, you, you've got some you, you've got some initiatives that you're working on, and I know one of those big projects right now. And we, we alluded to this before, and you the, the the obvious personal connection to the Stronger Than Stigma movement. Um, particularly, you're working with the way I understand it is you're working with veterans, mm -hmm. um, and I, I was hoping you could maybe just talk to us a little bit about that. And yeah, absolutely. And, uh, again, you you shared your personal story, but maybe draw the connection between the veterans and what's going on now. Yeah, so this is, it's a really cool collaborative project. And one of the things that makes it really cool is that it's all, it all comes back to relationships I've formed through my podcast, which is, I think, kind of an unsung part of what makes podcasting such a powerful platform. It's not just 30 second videos or 260 character posts like you and I have been talking for over an hour, right? Mm -hmm. I talked to each of my guests. It's like a 45 to 60 minute mm -hmm. conversation and you learn about what these other people are doing and then you have opportunities to work with them towards something right. bigger. You know, people, people want to monetize a podcast, mm -hmm. you know, but you could also kind of like weaponize a podcast for, for good. And so, um, the stronger than stigma initiative is a collaboration between myself and two former guests. One, her name is crystal Miranda. She runs a nonprofit based in Miami called the healthy mind movement. Their, their mission is to destigmatize mental health. Um, she's a PhD student at this point. They also just opened a location in New York city and they partner mostly with fitness brands and gyms to host events that raise money to help people gain access to mental health services. Mm -hmm. The second one um, is local here in Phoenix. His name is Chris Phillips, and he started a nonprofit in 2020 called Quality Resilience Fitness, or QRF, which is a play on a military term. Quick reaction force. So. Yeah, there we go. So what he does is he is raising funds and then those funds, 100% of those funds go towards helping veterans find and join like small community-based gyms. So he subsidizes like three to six months of membership. Um, if those people, he's got a couple people he's currently sponsoring for strongman events this summer. Mm. So he'll pay their entrance fees. He'll help them buy equipment after. So he'll help them find a community gym, not just here in Phoenix, but anywhere in the country. He'll, you know, talk to the owner and then he'll do check-ins with that client. Like, how are things going at the gym? Like, are you being treated right? And he'll also check in with the gym. Like, are they showing up? Mm -hmm. Are they doing, right. are they following like through on their commitment? Accountability. Yeah. yeah. And so he was uh, in army infantry, did multiple tours in the Middle East, and then was medically retired after he collapsed during a training exercise and they found out that his heart was stopping for three to five seconds, he needed a pacemaker. Mm. So he got a pacemaker put in and was, became a liability, you know, to his yep. job they and was retired anymore. Right. And so very quickly, you know, he's out of the military. He was expecting to still be in f as long as he possibly could indefinitely. Right. I don't think he had any exit plans. And I think, 
you know, as, as unprepared as I may have felt to like enter the professional field, it sounds like when you get discharged from the military, there's very minimal resources or training about like, what is it to reenter civilian life? It's actually Especially if awful. you have no plan and it's like a, it's a emergent retirement. Basically, that, that transition is traumatic for a lot of these guys. We, some very close relationships and guys that we worked with and, and, and for and around currently in the past. And to hear the stories, it's just kind of like with all that structure and all of those things that they have, the resources they have available to them, which can be a double edged sword for some, for mm-hmm. some people, they're just turned loose. They're just turned It'd loose. It'd be like walking through a portal onto a different right. planet, I'm sure. And so, you know, your communication style instantly has to change your sense of purpose, your role, um, the importance of your day to day activities. It's all just gone like instantly. And so Chris quickly had no fitness routine anymore, sort of gaining a lot of weight. Um, and he, he was basically just living in a room at a friend's house with a mattress on the floor and like a tactical box with a TV on it. And, you know, all his uh, prescriptions from the VA that he got as mm-hmm. part of the protocol for, you know, dealing with the anticipated anxiety and depression that'll probably PTSD. come mm-hmm. with discharge. Um, and just one day he decided he was going to take all those meds at once because it was better than what his life was at that point. And so that's a very similar story to mine. Like, mm-hmm. And he, um, luckily his buddy who he was living with, like walked into the room. I don't know how much longer, but found him like passed out on the floor, shoved his fingers down his throat. The guy's girlfriend at the time happened to be a nurse. So she whipped up a cocktail and poured it down his throat. He threw everything up and didn't die. Wow. Um, and so at that point he started, you know, that was his switch to be like, okay, I need to get myself in better shape. I got to figure my shit out. And as he was getting, going through his own sort of journey back into fitness and finding some sort of purpose for his life, he started realizing you know, how many of his friends and connections from the military had attempted and then also attempted and succeeded at killing themselves. And I think it was late 2019, one of the soldiers that he trained and was like very close with and still had a, a relationship with and would talk to frequently committed suicide. And that was the tipping point for him to think, you know, I've, I've sort of gotten a hold of my own health. Like now I need to do something about mm. this. And so that's when he started the nonprofit. So, you know, he wants veterans to feel like someone truly has their back. He wants them to find community. That's why he prioritizes finding small gyms and doing all the follow-up. You know, he wants to find places for soldiers to have someone who will call them out when they need it because that's very familiar mm-hmm. to them, to place where they've got a clear, like, leadership hierarchy and someone who will hold them accountable um, and just not let them slip through the cracks. So that's the Stronger Than Stigma initiative is a partnership, again, between myself, Crystal, and Chris. And, you know, we are selling some limited merchandise. Sales actually end on the 18th of June. So by the time this comes out, they may be over. However, both of those organizations will still exist. Still exist. Right. I'll still be here. Um, and so 100% of the proceeds from this initiative are going to QRF to help support, support um, that his mission. Yeah, it's amazing. What a, again, kind of full circle coming all the way back to the giving back part. It's in, it's. I was sort of alluding to becoming a coach, becoming a physical therapist. We're often faced with adversity and things in our life that kind of drive us into coaching. You know, down the road, and that's kind of how we get here. We kind of have testimony or story same same thing but at a much 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 deeper level and it's something that's not popular to talk about um it's not it has been unrecognized for a long long time however it is becoming more either that more, or it's been it's been recognized and we've just become just numb to, to it yeah kind like of I ignoring was, it 2000 i saw a statistic it was in 2018 1.5 million veterans um reached out for like for mental health services and I think 6,500 plus veteran suicides in 2018. So it's still between 18 and 20 a day. And it's not just veterans. This is happening. The suicide rate in while active is mm-hmm. increasing. It bumped up. I did some research coming in today. Uh, the Pentagon reported it bumped up 25% in the last like quarter of 2020. I mean, that's that's a massive 
amount. It's huge. It's, yeah. it's huge. So it's not just happening after, it's happening during, and it's not just veterans, right? It's not, right, right. It's not just active and, and you know, active duty and, and veteran veterans. It's, this is happening, obviously, to a lot of people everywhere in this stigma around this invisible issue uh, that this person is broken. They're not broken, right? We're, we're all having a little bit of a, a challenge, right? We're, I'm challenged right now. And it doesn't, it doesn't mean I'm broken and it doesn't mean I can't function and it doesn't mean I can't do things or have relationships or be a parent or have a job and, and still be successful or, or productive that way. It just means I need some help. And more than ever, we're seeing this locally where I am, that the challenges and the resources that are not available, some very, very um, close personal relationships where people are finding a real challenge in, in getting the help that they want. It's not that they don't they don't want it. It's not that they're not looking for it. Like, if you're, where is it? Yeah, if you're in the mental health care profession right now, you are probably way overworked and uh, likely underpaid. You know, for the for the work that you are doing, and this goes back to the physical therapy thing. You know, you have to see so many patients in you know so much time. How much help are you really giving people? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it goes down to you go weeks and weeks without seeing or talking to somebody, and of course, the first thing that comes out is they're throwing medication at you. Which, again, that that's not a bad thing. There's a time and a place for that, and sometimes you take that life jacket, right? Yeah, or you yeah you call like an emergency hotline or right. you take yourself to the ER. There's so many whatever, things. Which is just not a great place to start. <laughs> right. No, it isn't. It's, you know, people. The you, ER, that is. Right. You, In fact, again, going back to some personal relationships, that can be just as traumatizing or, or more, and it can discourage you from going to get further help. Um, and if you walk in to the ER with, in like a mental health crisis, I, I don't work in an ER, I'm, this is an assumption, like you're not going to be first in line. Cause you're walking in there looking fine and some other guy might be walking in there with like a bullet hole in their right, stomach right. or like just bleeding it's triage right, right? Yeah, yeah it's triage so like you're gonna you might be there for four or five hours right. in this chaotic traumatic space time yeah, yeah when time. you weren't when you weren't comfortable at home right you you, you went there because you feared you might do something yeah. to yourself yeah and yeah. i think just just before i lose my train of thought on just that term broken like no you're not broken but it would be okay to say like i feel like my brain is broken, broken. right now mm. because it's it's part of your health like you don't you don't get written off forever for having a broken arm right it's like well that's a like too bad your arm's so weak you piece of shit like right. why did you go and break your arm it's probably your fault suck it up right it's like no you're broken okay we need to fix that like let's get some help for that like we know you know other broken things get fixed mm -hmm. like get prioritized get talked about as a individual thing and that was actually one of the conversations with crystal on my show was how mental health diagnoses become an identity like i am depressed mm -hmm. versus i have depression like you don't it talk about that with idea. musculoskeletal things <laughs> i or neurological things even like i am a stroke right. no you had a stroke now what yeah, like that's just part of what now? that's part of you, right? right? It's not all of you. Whereas mental health tends to be like hmm. you identify as you get you get identified, which then makes you identify yourself as that thing, versus that diagnosis just being a part of everything else that you have. Like, and so that's totally different terminology. Like words are so powerful. Likely very unhelpful. <laughs> Super unhelpful. <laughs> right. Yeah, if I yeah. am depressed, like versus I have depression like mm -hmm. that instantly you think like oh if i have something i can do something about it if i am something i can't change that. what am i gonna yeah it's that's like, just who i am yeah i am six feet yeah. tall it's just like i can't change that right exactly know? so right. it's totally different well so how can people support man what, what what can they do well so i mean go to i believe it's qrffitness.com mm -hmm. or qrf fit on instagram mm -hmm and just connect with Chris, like whether you're a military veteran or someone who just believes in that cause, wants to get involved, donate, donate your time at one of the events that he goes and supports at a local gym. Like it's all extremely helpful. Um, the Healthy Mind Movement is regularly, what they do primarily is they'll do limited edition merchandise drops in partnership with other organizations. And then those funds again go to helping people um, get the resources and the support that they 
need. Yeah. Right. And then, I mean, just keep listening to the Essential Strength right. podcast because this is this won't be the last time that I like partner with a guest on some sort of philanthropic right. endeavor. Yeah. And so you heard it there. So, you know, the Essential Strength podcast. And if they want to reach out to you and, you know, find out a little bit more about you and follow your journey and the things that you're doing, where, where can they find you? You know, you go on social media there, maybe. Yeah. The most active by far on Instagram. Um, that's Dr. David Skolnick, DPT. Mm-hmm. Um, on Instagram, and I'm on Facebook, don't use it a ton. And then you can check out strongerinmotion.com if you're interested in you know, working with me or one of the coaches who I work with. You know, Our company is small, but really what we're focusing on is having clinicians. So going back to bridging the gap, mm-hmm. I think one of the things that it's really powerful is you know, helping what I, part of the thing that I wanna do is help empower clinicians to also work as coaches. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could be your own bridge, right? If you, as a physical therapist or a chiropractor, Absolutely. if you understand enough about the, the training side of things, mm-hmm. you could discharge someone to yourself right? and have a, have a bridge and a, and a continuing training application that they are able to then work with you far better than a exercise handout, but also then educating trainers to think more like clinicians. Mm-hmm. Those are the two ways that, that those are the two sides of the bridge. So stronger in motion, it's, it's myself and my wife and a couple chiropractors based out in California and a trainer up in Portland. And, you know, we, we are trying to be a small, you know, brick in that bridge. So stronger in Yeah. I think you guys are doing an awesome job. You've got an amazing group of people and you've already alluded to the PPSC and, uh, and the great things that they're doing. Um, I would, you know, if, if you're a coach out there, you know, just know that there are guys like, you know, like David that are out there and are, and are bringing some really, really high level stuff. It doesn't matter what level you're coming in at. You're going to take stuff away from this. Um, that that PPSC is an, is an amazing is an amazing group of people. Number one, uh, uh, we had experience. We, we had them in for uh, for their PPSC certification at, to the studio and and, uh, and hosted and everything from the start to the finish, from the initial contact to the logistics, to the, the people that came down. We had, you know, uh, Dan and Tasha from up in Washington state came, came down and the delivery of information, the group of people that was there. And then the follow up, which mm. I've been involved in a lot of these things, but the follow up that, that, that they provide, uh, those that go through that course is amazing. Uh, that the ongoing support and community that you can be involved in. And David's now part of that community and, you can have some of David if you're if you're involved there. So oh yeah, so. it's like three articles a week, two yeah. podcasts, you know, a, a mentorship, a master's class, yeah. right. um, a super active Facebook group where there's coaches from all over the country. You know, if if a client is moving to another state, right. like you're pretty much guaranteed to have another coach who can help them or ask a question. It's it's it it's super active. It is super supportive. You got you got the instructors chiming in on right. everything. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's very accessible. So and I think that right now in today's day and age, they're nailing that and that's so important. So, And Dan and Tasha are just freakishly yeah. strong <laughs> people. Yeah. So, Shout out to Dan and Tasha. Yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing, amazing uh, couple, couple people there. Well, David, man, I just want to thank you for coming down today and, and spending time with me and sharing your personal story um, and your passion and, you know, your insight you know, from looking at it from a couple of different lenses, but then being able to take those lenses and, and and really focus on the important stuff. I mean, one of the good guys out there getting it done, I knew this was going to be a good time. Uh, And uh, I'm so stoked to have had you here and be willing to share all that. So thanks very much, man. No, it was was my pleasure. This was super fun. I'm glad you had me on. Um, Glad we have, again, as we've talked about a mutual connection, you know, that's, that's where this starts with a mutual friend and, uh, a lot of opportunity comes from that. Yeah, I, and I agree, and there'll just be more. Uh, sky's the limit for you, man. I, I I know that for sure. Good luck with the new, the new, the new endeavor, endeavors, and uh, best of luck to you, man. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Iron Sights. If you enjoyed our conversation, you can support our mission by hitting the subscribe button, leaving a review, and sharing the podcast with a friend. I'll see you on the next episode.